All right, everyone, I guess we can start talking about the lecture where, uh, and I suppose other people will join us as we, as we proceed. Um, thank you so much for coming. Um, I'm honored to be able to uh, discuss this lecture with you and share this um, beautiful feeling we have together, um, feel the good energy that we generate. So um, it's, um, this lecture is, I think, maybe one of the easiest to understand. It's not convoluted, you know, psychologically, as, as some of the lectures, many of the lectures are. Um, this lecture kind of gives a new take on the idea of uh, follow, uh, you know, inner laws or God's laws, divine laws. You know, I keep thinking about the early Christians in the Roman Empire you know, that obviously they were instructed to follow a different set of laws uh, from the laws of the society in which they were living. Um, but the God's lecture really is a big new wrinkle on, the, on that whole idea. And the God gives a historical perspective about inner and outer laws. So I'd just like to read a couple of sentences that I think really summarize this lecture. On page eight, the Christ consciousness brings a new morality that little by little wipes away the outer commandments, outer regulations, and the outer written and unwritten laws. Laws are still necessary for quite a time in your terms, but the trend is in this direction. Where you act out your lower self, you need those laws to protect others. But where you have outgrown the lower self, you do not need to be told not to harm others. You know it and you have no desire to do so. Later on, he says, same page, only those who have overcome rebellion against authority because they are their own inner authority, because they have the honesty, can be free. That means embracing change. So, I mean, I, I just had to think about, um, the way the papers are full of crime, you know, obviously what, what, uh, if it bleeds, it leads. And so obviously, uh, media focuses on crime and, um, what the guide calls things, which are obviously wrong, where you harm other people or you cause suffering. And I'm just kind of thinking, I guess I'm, I'm kind of hoping that if we are able to um, graduate from the age of mass incarceration where we have to uh, punish everyone or punish many people, put them in prison, you know, that somehow there could be a kind of birth of this Christ consciousness where people don't commit acts of violence, don't do things that cause other people to suffer. And what a great benefit that would be for our country and for the world if we didn't have to spend all this money on security and weapons, um, this inner morality that the guy talks about, you know, one hopes and believes it's spreading more and more. And that's what the guide means by the new age. So just to go over the lecture a little bit, uh, in the beginning, the guide talks about um, what he calls a seed plan. There's a seed plan for the individual and for the planet. And the seed plan is something that charts an evolutionary um, ladder, an evolutionary pattern of growth. And at every stage, the guide says, energy comes into us, comes into the organism, whether it's us as people or the planet, that would propel us to the next phase or the next stage of evolution. So, um, the idea is that there's a power and energy in the seed plan. He says, each stage is an orderly step toward the fulfillment of the seed plan. The seed plan automatically releases new energies. When the entity follows its plan, these energies become extremely beneficial. So the way I see it, um, there is a way in which we can live 
where we don't block uh, unfoldment of energies, where we are able to uh, reconcile opposites, you know, make progress on dissolving our images. And when we live in that way, a lot of energy becomes available to us to keep us moving forward. When, however, the movement is hindered as the ego, outer ego consciousness re resists the process, makes itself insensitive and ignores its urgings, then the energies are not allowed to unfold in their instinctively, instinctively, in intrinsically harmonious way. The constructive power of these energies then turns destructive, though only in the limited light of human vision. Actually, the destruction is always aimed at eliminating the obstructions, the untruth, the infringements on divine enfoldment. So he says later, whenever the consciousness is contrary to truth, the energies are inverted and turn apparently against the self. So the word apparently is important, right? Because as the guide always says, you know, the destructive is, this, is its own medicine. The destructive is created to be the remedy. So when, um, as he says, the blockages in the consciousness gets in the way of the released energies need to be dissolved. And this manifests in the life of the person in upheaval, crisis, painful destruction. The individual needs to learn how to see and understand these happenings. They're not haphazard events. So in other words, as always, you know, right, the spiritual paradox is that when destructiveness appears in our lives, it's positive, right? Because it breaks down the resistance to change. So, you know, the positive is positive and the negative is positive, right? It's like the mathematical thing, the absolute value, there's no negative value to something. But if we have to go through destructiveness and pain, that's the lesson that we need to do. That's what we have to go through. So then the guy talks about um, the state of dualistic perception, me against others, diametrically opposed interests, you know, what's good is me for me is not good for you and vice versa. And the guide, of course, gets to the place in many of lectures where he says that what harms me harms you and vice versa. What harms you harms me. There's never any difference between what is beneficial to you and what's beneficial for me. There's never a zero sum game where one something is good for someone and bad for someone else. It's always the right course is always beneficial for everyone. That's a very hard awareness to take in. That's something that a lot of people would certainly not agree with, but that's what the pathwork says. So the guy talks about the apparent diversity of interest between the self and others. And that that is a dualistic perception, which is not true. He says that contrasting times before in history with today, in earlier periods, people were governed merely by impulse and desire. What was immediately gratifying seemed good and no consideration could be given to anything beyond it. Consciousness was then in its infancy, only in the age that has now come to an end could the struggle be taken up to choose between interests that seemed divergent and as I said before, quote, the pain created by the blindness of the undeveloped state becomes its own medicine and lesson. So it just seems to me that this awareness is very apropos today, right? Because looking at it from a global point of view, um, one country says, you know, the resources that I need, you can't have those. I can only benefit in a certain way and not another way. And so, oh, I've just been joined by a puppy. Hey, what's up, boy? Uh, oh, oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Happy. Who is it? It's Happy the Wheaton, the Wheaton pup. 
Cut down half. My girlfriend's here. Yeah, she's kind of running away. Hey, Carol. Uh, sorry about that. <laughs> okay. Uh, so anyway, um, so what I'm trying to get to is that the, um, I think if we're in the new age and that has to have been the whole, the old age. And in the old age, um, people did not want to make sacrifices because they believed it was in their own interest to grab what they could for themselves. As he says, and even today, of course, that attitude persists, right? I mean, that's what, of course, the uh, environmentalists call the tragedy of the commons, right? In other words, when an area is put forward for everyone to use, some people take advantage of that availability. But, you know, the commons being, um, you're familiar with this concept, right? Uh, the commons being like a, a, a piece of land where people could graze their, their sheep. And um, that if one person kind of commandeers it and, and grazes their sheep and cuts the grass so nobody else can graze their sheep, then that's one person taking advantage of something which is meant for everyone, appropriating it, taking the resources. So in that way, many people believe that uh, intrinsically it's, it's beneficial to be selfish. But the guide is saying that in fact, it's not the case that if you correctly apprehend reality, you'll see that no sacrifice is necessary, which is to say that everyone has to make shared sacrifices, but even making a sacrifice is not a sacrifice. It's another one of these paradoxes, I think. That's the way to look at it, right? Because if you make a sacrifice, which is necessary, it makes you stronger and benefits everyone and yourself. So um, now the guide says that people don't need to make a sacrifice because now uh, what's good for one person benefits everyone and vice versa. Those who have acted primarily on the selfish and destructive level must come to a change of heart if the powerful energies that are being released on the inner plane of the planet are to be creative and constructive for them. Otherwise, they will create unbearable tensions that will culminate in crisis. So the guide is saying it's time for everyone to give up um, selfish and destructive aims because those will not benefit them or anyone else. And this really, this influx of the new age of the Christ consciousness is this, this is what's going on now. This is the crisis that we find ourselves in, in our modern industrialized civilization. He says, the planet earth has come to a stage of develop development in which the old structure can no longer be maintained. It cannot bear the tensions and restrictions of the old limited consciousness. A new vision must be gained in which the self and others are perceived as one. You have to look for this new vision beneath the limited vision to which the immediate consciousness is so accustomed. This new vision brings enormous peace, security, joy, and self-expression. It is not an illusory image of wishful thinking. It is stark reality. So then the guide um, basically calls on us you know, path workers and people of goodwill. Many people, many human beings are on the brink of change and need help and guidance to pull them over into the new. Even those who are by and large ready to let the new consciousness express itself through them, whose personality already embraces the new Christ consciousness, find areas within where they still maintain the old selfish narrow vision those are the areas you call your problems. Perhaps we can now see this in a different and more comprehensive light. It is too simple to say that these are problems. They express a rhythm of growth and expansion. So, and then the, the guide is talking about us, I think. Some people are prepared for the new age of consciousness in this sense 
this consciousness already exists, they are the pioneers, they create a new civilization. So um, then the guy, the guy mentions later on the creation of the Pathwork Center. So the guide basically says that we're in an age now of personal responsibility for the people that are tuned into the divine. And that in this state of personal responsibility, you don't need, um, you don't need uh, a rigid rules of behavior. You don't need rigid morality. You're able to determine for yourself what the right course of action is without rules, without a rigid moral code. As he says in many lectures, he says that no action per se is right or wrong, provided you're attuned to the inner voice and provided you do the work of looking at both sides of everything, examining your motivations, provided you do that, you're able to make decisions which may be at variance with what people consider to be moral codes or laws. So it's really the age of the God consciousness within the individual. And the guide says that it was necessary for people to move from a rigid obedience to an outer law, God's rules, to atheism, and then come back inside the self to locate the seat of authority in the divine voice within. That's what he says on the bottom of page four. So the guide is talking about um, sort of hearkening back to what I said about the seed plan, great powerful energies are available for people that tune into them and tune into their own divine inner self based on the pathwork of self-facing where they're able to expose, understand their images and kind of get through the BS and, and, and get through some of the habitual ways of thinking, this dualistic consciousness. Um, then I always like this, this concept the guide sometimes talks about, about how people think that when they do inner work or when they come together in a group to do spiritual work, that that's not reality. Other people laugh and say, that's not real, you're navel gazing. The guide says it's really totally upside down. That's the reality. The outer world is not as significant as that, as that process of coming together with people, spiritual meditation, spiritual communion, and self-facing. That is actually more real than the quote-unquote outer life. So um, the guide, of course, again, um, tells us we have to keep working on the images, the things that bar our development of unitive consciousness. And uh, that's, that's pretty much it. Um, again, the guide on page six talks about the rigid concepts of good and evil and how we're kind of beyond that now, or we can be beyond, beyond that. The rigid law that had to exist for the primitive consciousness of the past had to decree do's and don'ts, commands and prohibitions. The totally childish and self-indulgent consciousness does need such rules imposed from the outside. Without them, there would have been chaos and the most destructive impulses would have been acted out to a much greater degree. Such severity, however, also brought a certain rigidity and superficiality to human existence. Obeying rules blindly is a temptation to avoid thinking for oneself and struggling with the often more complex issues of inner morality. So, I mean, that's certainly a good message for our times, right? Um, we have a tough, it's tough for us to uh, struggle with these issues. It's easier to um, obey a code or jump on some kind of a um, ideological framework that other people have put forward. It's harder 
to think for yourself and to try to determine, um, to find the voice, the inner voice of unity within. And the guide says, as I mentioned before, only when you sort out the dishonest motives on both sides can you open the channel to your inner God and receive the guidance you require. This means labor, courage, search. Obeying the outer rule prevents this. So what I've shown you about how to approach such questions is truly an expression of the new age consciousness that will spread much more and more over the planet as humanity develops. So, as I said, the guide is talking about the outer rules making way for a new inner sense of morality and conscience. And when one tunes into the, to the unit of consciousness, he says, you must be overwhelmed by the grandeur of this divine scheme in which all is well and there's nothing to fear if you choose to see this plan and go with it. You know your inner truth. No one else can tell it to you. No one act is right or wrong per se. On that level. Yet it is also true at certain times that your inner plan, your divine self wishes you, needs you to go into a certain direction and not in another, but this cannot be superimposed from the outside. He says, as I mentioned before earlier about crime, you know, and disorder, the outer law is often parallel to the inner law. Many outer laws are manifestations of divine law. When it comes to destructive acts of killing, stealing, or in other ways, robbing others of their rights, there can be no question that the outer law is parallel to the inner law. But when we also encounter more complex question, situations where the inner law is not that simple, this is where our new approach can bring forth the truth and reality of the divine law on the inner level. So it's interesting. Um, the guide talks about a destructive act of, quote, robbing others of their rights. Well, that really does seem to be in tune with a lot of what we're, we're seeing and thinking about today, right? The whole concept of people's rights and the negative, destructive um, act of robbing people of their rights. Um, so I guess we could have a discussion about what people's rights are, but the whole idea that that is an offense that is against spiritual law to rob someone of their rights is worth thinking about. And again, last page, the laws of morality will be completely flexible. Each case is different. But for that, you need the labor, courage, and honesty of self-knowledge so that you cannot not be corrupted by lower self motives. As I read earlier in the beginning. So this is a, I really see this lecture as a call to action myself. I mean, this is a lecture which really asks us to believe in the reality of the unit of consciousness and to act in a way that supports it and to lead others into that recognition. So that's, that's my summary of the lecture. Any thoughts? Tracy, I always turn to you. Um, as my co-lecture picker. Okay. What do you think? So, um, I chose this lecture for obvious reasons. I thought it was very parallel to what was happening in the world today. But the other thing that I always found interesting about this lecture was an analogy to, to what I learned in law school. One of the first um, cases that we did in torts was a true story about a, a, a couple who, lived at the end of a dead end street. And every Christmas they decorated their house and it was visible from the major road that ran parallel to it. And so slowly over the years, 
people would come off of the major road and go down the dead end street to get a closer look. And as the years went by, the decorations got more and more elaborate to the point that the it became almost impossible for the other houses on the street to get their own cars down to, to, to their houses because the, it was so backed up with people looking to see, you know, the, the Christmas decorations. And so there was a lawsuit because finally one of the one of the one of the couples, you know, said, I, I can't get I can't get down to my own driveway. I have to park at the end of the street and walk down with my groceries and whatever packages I have. It's it's obviously it's Christmas time. So there was, you know, inclement, inclement weather, weather and ice sometimes on the streets. And um, anyway, the, the, the judges decided that they had to take some of the Christmas decorations down, but the holding of the case was that your rights end where the next persons begin. And I always found that to be a, a pivotal lesson that I learned in law school, which is very applicable to this, le to this lesson, which to this lecture, because it's like, you know, if you just think about it sort of in absolute terms, a person should have the right to do whatever they want in terms of decorating their own house for Christmas, but not if it gets to the point that it's starting to take away the rights of the other people that are, are, are around there. So you know, these are the kinds of things where there are no hard and fast rules. There are no, there are no clear demarcation lines and and clear laws about what can and can't be done in terms of decorating a house for Christmas, but just that concept that you, the, the holding that that person's rights ended where the next person's began, I just thought was very um, applicable to, to this lecture. So between, between oh, I'm always remembering that and, and then just obviously what's going on in the world today, I thought this was a, a good lecture um, for us to do now. And you summed it up perfectly. You know, it's just something that we're not going to be able to look externally for, you know, code of conduct. We're going to have to be looking inside of ourselves. And the other thing I wanted to say was that when I remember when um, recently I was talking to our daughter, the one who just had the had the baby, and she said that she remembered in kindergarten that there was some, and so she was five, she, that there were some a girl who in kindergarten was sort of, you know, the mover and the shaker of the kindergarten class and was deciding, you know, who could play with who and everybody's been on the playground. I don't need to explain in more detail. And she said that she knew, oh, even then at five, she said she knew that was wrong. That, you know, nobody had, you know, really explained to her at that point, you know, that you, know, this is, that you should be allowed to, to play with who you want or not play with you. But she just said she just knew, you know, and so she, she just decided that if she, if that girl wasn't going to play with whatever girl, then, then she wasn't going to play with her or something like that. But I thought it was interesting that even a five-year-old child just knows, because you, you, you can feel it inside yourself. And um, that's where we all obviously need to go to. And that's where we are going to. I mean, it's, it's very clear to me that there's new consciousness arising and that it's critical that it do so. We're not going to be able to survive under the old regime. We're, that's clear. You know, we're sort of imploding in ourselves every which way you look. And so we have to find within ourselves the new, the new, the new way, the new morality, the new, the new unit of state where, where we're more one and as opposed to these separated individualized, you know, entities, manifestations of consciousness. We, we have to really try to feel the connections below the surface so that we can feel more, more what you said when you first started, which is that what nothing can be good for one person if it's harmful to somebody else. Yeah, you know, I'm thinking um, back in the 60s, 70s, there was a button that people were, were questioning authority, right? And obviously it's a good thing to do to question authority because what you're doing is you're questioning the outer authority. Um, now, just in the same way that the guy talks about that atheism is a necessary step, you have to reject the rigid code and the idea that God is like a big father who's going to dictate terms and tell you what's right or wrong. You have to find it within. In the same way now, people are rejecting authority. Totally. All over the place. There's no authority. 
everyone, you know, I think that conspiracy theories are kind of sort of equal to rejection of authority. It's like, if I want to believe that the moon is made of green cheese, I can believe that, you know, who says it's not? Can you prove it, right? COVID, Fauci, I mean, whatever, Trump, I mean, the whole deal. Whatever I say is what, what I believe, whatever I believe is valid. Now, this may be an interim stage of, of basically a distortion of the concept of questioning authority. There is no authority except what I, like the famous gut feeling, right? Now, we, as we move into the new age consciousness, the Christ consciousness, we understand that authority has to do with what's beneficial for all, for everyone. Not where you're scapegoating one group, you know, or you're making somebody a target, something like that. That's what I'm thinking about. You know, because it's so interesting, the whole climate of total distrust of like everything. Um, I was just talking with a new hire in my office, you know, we run communications for transit. And uh, she said, you know, the minute, we had an incident on the N train where someone opened fire on the train and shot 10 people in Brooklyn and nobody died miraculously enough. But she told me that the minute it happened, memes started popping up on Facebook that it really didn't happen. These guys are crisis actors. There's a picture of somebody, well, he's pouring blood on the ground. It's not really real. It's all staged. This whole concept about everything is staged. You can't trust everything. I think it relates to this lecture because it has to do with people questing, where is the authority? What can we really believe in? Right. Any other thoughts? Well, just where does that place um, somehow the idea of leadership? Uh, you know, to, uh, you know, when you say you can't question authority or, or whatever. I mean, I, I guess when I read this lecture, I felt like, wait a minute, this was written, you know, the time period when this lecture was de delivered, maybe that's where the world was. And I felt like, well, this is a different world today. I feel like there's so much, um, you know, uh, distrust, fake news, um, us against them, you know, win, you know, winners, losers, that I, I find it's sort of like, yes, there's the path work, but examples or pockets of places where there is another kind of consciousness, I find kind of scarce. So. Mm. Stephen, what do you think? Well, uh, you know, I, I see the world is really, uh, divergent into two separate areas. One could look at the world as coming apart. That's not my view. Um, I, another way of looking at it is to see that there are really decent people that are trying to put it together. And I think we're emerging out of what some say is the third dimension, moving up to the fifth dimension. And before we do that, um, there's chaos, but the fifth dimension, and I'll be somewhat esoteric here, is at a higher vibration. And we're moving up to that. So actually the future looks very positive, although one can look at COVID and, and Ukraine and on and on and on. But I, I choose to also look at where developing vaccinations I also look at it that I think we're in some areas we're much more tolerant with races and what's happening. And um, the shootings of, of, of blacks and, and people coming out. So, you know, I, I think it depends what you wish to look at. And I think the world is teetering, and not on destruction, but on teetering on improving. And for me, there's hope. Uh, I see it in myself, actually. I, I think my, my life has paralleled a lot of this. Uh, you know, in terms of loss, you don't steal, you don't do this, you don't do that. I, I, I don't need those laws. I mean, I'm not going to steal. It's not who I am. I'm not going to kill. It's not really who I am. 
But yet earlier on in my life, I did things that weren't very nice. It's certainly not anything that breaks the law, but breaks maybe the moral code uh, of hurting somebody, of being relationships where I hurt people. Um, and, and of course, I did it for self-preservation, and it was right. There, there was even a book when I grew up that said, don't, don't get mad, don't get angry, get even, or something like that. I mean, it really depicts what was going on earlier on in my life. Um, you know, get revenge, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. He did it to me, I'll do it back to him. But I covered all that up um, when I was that way, where I, I got my, quote, revenge in some way. Uh, and it felt good at some level. But I truly believe now in retrospect, looking back, if I was to just be with my heart, not my mind, I said, ah, that's great. Yeah, he said that. You really said something that really knocked me down. There was a certain degree of pain in my heart that I wouldn't allow myself to experience it. Um, and, and now more and more as I allow myself to experience when I, I think I might have hurt somebody inadvertently or otherwise, there is a certain degree of pain. It's like a boomerang effect. What I give out, I get back. And, and I think the world is starting to come to terms with that, in spite of the things we see on the news and so on. Uh, so I do believe that we are moving towards a more caring, generous way of being, where the laws aren't so much external, but internal. Of, of it doesn't feel right and therefore I will not do it. And to take the rest of the pie doesn't feel right or the last piece doesn't feel right. I won't enjoy it. So let's cut it up into five individual pieces. So we each have a piece. That feels to me much better. And that's what counts. And I think we're moving towards that. And maybe it paraphrases a lot of what the guy says. Yeah, I must say, I agree with you, Steve. I really like hearing this point of view. <laughs> <laughs> so do I. Thank you. I, gr I agree with you completely, Steve, and I think that's where we are moving to. Absolutely. Maybe it'll be a bit of a bumpy ride getting there, but we'll get there. Absolutely. What do you I think, Beverly? Really because of our youth, and I believe our 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 youth are no longer satisfied with following anything rigid and have really been moving in a direction that are expanding. And so I, you know, it's interesting. I have um, I have children in their 30s now. They're not even in their 20s. They're just early 30s. And just to be with them and their friends and just their whole way, um, you know, they're, they'll question anything and figure anything out. And, you know, 4th of July holiday, I was visiting my son. He lives in Salt Lake City for three years to visit him. And the difference in three years in that area, talk about, oh, um, following rigid rules. And um, I guess because of the very vast Mormon influence in Salt Lake City, there was a rigidity years ago. It's totally gone. It's, I kept saying, why does it feel like I'm in, on the West Coast or in Northern California or Seattle? And they said, because during COVID, there was a lot of immigration from there. And so what felt like that really was that, that um, you know, younger people started moving into the area, bringing their younger and more forward 
accepting ways with them and um, the society has changed dramatically in three years there. So it was kind of, you know, the parts in, in this lecture where it, it's, it speaks to um, kind of the, the, old, the old rules and, and laws and, and um, of religion, maybe even of society doesn't, doesn't hold, hold true any longer. So I love this lecture. <laughs> Thank you. Mm. Yeah. Beverly, what do you think? Um, I, I was thinking with regards to the, the part of the lecture where they talk about <clears throat> people's rights and it's wrong to in, intrude on other people's rights. And, and what occurred to me is if everybody has their own kind of trajectory towards God and their own their own contract with the with them with themselves that to impose somebody else's rules kind of takes away their autonomy does that make sense do you know what i mean no i think you're absolutely right yeah i feel that um yeah i mean right in some sense you know everyone has to come to their own moral moral code through a process of self-facing yeah 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 and it assumes that you know better than somebody else well, the whole thing about whether you're able to have a moral code that is pure or not pure is probably the wrong word, but that is in accordance with divine law. Yeah, evolved, yeah. Evolved, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and it's so interesting because, you know, we are unique. Everyone is unique in how they interpret the world and, and their own code. I mean, superficially, we all, we all agree, right, that you shouldn't steal and kill. Um, but, you know, when the guide says more problem, things get very more, much more complicated. Right, puppy? <laughs> Sorry. I think that's a yes from puppy. And a, an emphatic yes, yes. Oh. <laughs> so, so I would like to add something, some thoughts. All right. Go ahead. I just want to time myself. So, um, First, I wanna comment on the lecture, wonderful choice. And every lecture stands on its own, as the guide said, and it's a big and, every lecture has like invisible spokes that go out to other lectures. And that I think is very important because on, you read part of that, Alan, on page seven, um, where it says, you know, no one act is right or wrong per se, uh, only when you go deeply into yourself and transcend the rules, the adherence to public opinion and gave up the self-interest that comes from the lower self, the need to please, as well as the need to rebel and to spite. Right in there, we have the personality defenses of reason, will, and emotion. You know, who's the one that rebels and expresses spite? Well, that's the one with the dominant will defense. And who's the one that has the need to please? That's the dominant emotion, defense of submission. So it's like woven through here. So it, it behooves me to see where I'm coming from and what my intention is, and also uh, where my lower self is. So whenever I'm having to come out to have any kind of interaction with anybody who maybe I don't take on their view of something, a current situation like gun control or, or the vaccine, vaccine or whatever it is, where I know it means building bridges, listening to one another, show your research. And it's in this lecture, the guide is addressing that. However, for me, I have to clear my lower self first. And I have on my, my to-do list every day, I have a bunch of tools across the top, things that help me get to my center when I fall off of it. And one is L period, S period, which stands for lower self. 
And it means every day have some time outs where I connect with my God self and express my intention to release what is being triggered by X, Y, Z, whatever it is, being triggered by that because no one else causes my anger, my submission, anything like that. It is in me. So when, so then I talk with my God self that I'm now going to release what's triggered in me so that I may clear my energy field and be open to your, and I'm talking about my God self, light, love, and life. And being steeped in core energetics, I let it rip. And so I let it rip. It's not about anybody else. And when I come out of it, I'm just smiling and light. And so without that being throughout several times a day, I'm not able to have clarity in my decisions. So these tools that are brought out in the lectures, and they're there in every, in every lecture in some form or another, and know that I tend to want to look good and be more submissive. What's the other side of my coin? Aggression and nastiness. So I, my God self really smiles when I go to nasty, aggressive Marion in a really responsible way of saying what my intention is, that I'm clearing what has been stored in my energy field, and I choose to release it so that I may be filled with the light, love, and life of God. So I just want to speak up for that, those tools of, of the lower self expression in a responsible way and uh, see what one's intention is and know your dominant personality defense, because that is crucial in everything that we're doing in this passageway into the new age, the new humanity. It's crucial that what has been stored in the unconscious comes out. Yeah. So that's it. Tools in the toolbox. Yeah. It's, it's to me, it seems I follow the path of what feels good. And what I've learned is what feels good for me to, to try and get revenge, to be opinionated. I, I live in uh, part of it, obviously, half the time down in Florida, a place called Homo Sasa, which nobody ever heard of. It's really rural, backwater, but it's lovely. And I'm, I'm living down there with a partner. And, and, you know, she has a house down there and we share the house. And she and I both agreed that one should be vaccinated, wear a mask and all that. But being in Florida, especially with this governor, or whatever is DeSantis, I think, most people down there, at least where we are, which is on the West Coast, about an hour north, central West Coast, very pretty, um, don't believe in any of that. They, they don't want to be vaccinated because they think that it's a government plot of some kind, that they're injecting us with something where they can watch our movements. Why well, anybody wants to watch my life is going to be pretty bored and fall asleep. I, I don't, I can't imagine that ever happening. But they're against traveling with a mask or having a mask. And, and my partner down there is very upset about all of this. And I've realized I, I, I have a choice. I, I could also get upset about it and say, ah, oh, is that stupid, it's ridiculous. Or just try and see their point of view, whatever it may be. I may not agree with it, but really see their point of view. And when I, I'm in that, let's see their point of view, I feel better. <laughs> so to me, that's the road. It's just feel better rather than chastise them. And, and a couple of months ago, I spoke to my neighbor who doesn't believe in vaccinations and this and that, because, quote, he never gets sick, which I find ridiculous, but that's fine. That's my opinion. And I said to him, he said, you know, you don't come over. You don't, you don't, and I like these people. It is just quite amazing that they're, they're not getting it vaccinated, yet I still like them. It's not like their whole thing is I'm not getting vaccinated, so I dislike them and reject them. It just feels better to like parts of them 
And I realized that, and I said to him, quite honestly, I said, no, I really like you and I do miss our get togethers and so on, but honestly, you don't get vaccinated and I'm concerned. So he said, yeah, I, I can understand that. And we came to some middle road where rather than saying how ridiculous these people are, I, I found a, a part of them that's lovely. And it just, I think that's how you build in roles and, 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 and relationships. But it, it takes a certain degree of the effort and, and a certain degree of, um, I think dropping down from my traditional way of thinking that I grew up with. Uh, they don't, they're, they're ridiculous, hate them, put them down, criticize them, no. And somehow I realized there are different parts of who I am. And if I drop down into my heart, my heart doesn't think like that. My heart says, find the common ground. They're human beings and they're in pain and they're confused. They're probably as frightened as I am or confused as I am. <laughs> and, and find out what their feelings are. Why don't they get vaccinated? And if I look at their point of view, it makes sense for them. It makes total sense to them not to get vaccinated as it makes total sense for me to be vaccinated. And, and sometimes I wonder how on this planet can there be so many divergent opinions and they all seem right depending on how you look at it. So it's just really allowed me to live a lot more peacefully with myself and, and others, but certainly with myself. And I see how it affects my lady friends. Um, and um, many times I have to kind of stand back and not listen to it because she's, you know, imbued with this is the only way that's right. And anybody who doesn't do it is wrong. And that used to be my view. And you know what? I don't want to live that way any longer. I really don't. So. I mean, why, why has that opened up for me? Maybe it's patchwork, maybe it's Buddhism, maybe it's just <laughs> the universe opening up. I don't know. I really don't know. And it doesn't really matter. But it's a, I, for me, it's a much more satisfactory way to live rather than the vax versus the anti-vax groups. So anyway, that's just a little sidebar <laughs> that came up. Well, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. In other words, you find a commonality as a human being with your neighbors. And the fact that you identify the area of disagreement doesn't mean that you get excited, you get upset, you hate them or anything else. You acknowledge it. Yeah, there, there, you know, a human being's complex. There are many aspects about a human being. It's not yeah. just, yeah. he doesn't want to get vaccinated. And I do, so I hate him and I'm going to, you know, put up sure. a 20 foot fence. For sure. There are other aspects about this human being, and I'm sure if I was in trouble and needed help, they'd be there. It's not like, oh, this guy's got, got vaccinated, I don't like him. It's, they need, and vice versa, I'd be there. Mm. And I think that's where the world is moving towards, hopefully. Amen. Can I uh, just like respond to Stephen a little bit? Hi, everybody, I'm, I'm off hey, the hi. screen. I'm off the screen, excuse me, most of the time because it's hard to have both of us on at the same time with two, two devices, it starts to uh, echo. Um, so Stephen, I think you're speaking to giving a real life example of exactly what the lecture is talking about when it speaks to, and Alan, you touched on this, that those of us who are, you know, flatter ourselves, if you will, to think that we've moved into the new age consciousness that we have a responsibility to to our fellow human beings um, to to try to bring them along in, in in whatever way that we can i mean we obviously we know that everybody's not going to suddenly start doing the path work um, or start taking responsibility for themselves um, the way that we try to do and the ex and 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 the other aspect that you touched on Stephen is the um that we're all one 
right? That we're all manifestation of the divine consciousness and that even the people who may not be as educated, may not be as aware, maybe are suffering in ways that they haven't been able to open up to the presence of the divine within in the way that we, we try to do, um, to recognize that and to, you know, to, to demonstrate love and compassion uh, uh, for, for our fellow human beings and, and I think it's very interesting, you know, that the um, uh, scripture or, you know, religion always talks about love for thy neighbor. And, and so what you have expressed so, so beautifully, Stephen, is this love of neighbor, right? Which is to have a relationship with him and his wife where there isn't any judgment, where you're trying to understand and you, you show respect for his point of view, even though you disagree with it <clears throat> and you, you kindly express yourself, but it, it's not in terms of it being a contest of I'm right and you're wrong and let me tell you. Um, and I, I, I've come to the same place myself and I, and, and I try to uh, listen to people who, whose point of view is very different from mine and, and, and and maybe they're very rigid about it. And, and the lecture also speaks to that of how, when this, this, this the, um, what's it called again, Alan? It's not the divine seed, it's the- um, The seed plan? The seed plan, that the seed is within all of us. And that as we're evolving, if we don't respond to the next evolutionary stage as a human being, that then there are more destructive forces that become ex expressed. So in, uh, I suppose in path work terms, that might be that the, the lower self becomes stronger, it expresses itself. We attract negative energy and negative occurrences and that these things are take place in order to help wake us up, right? That there are so-called negative experiences that everything is, uh, is intended to help support our growth and development. Um, so I, I, what I like about the lecture is that in this time where try not to watch the news as much as I used to because it's just so upsetting, but when I think of the events in the world in terms of, of this lecture, it helps to give a context of a much broader divine context to what's taking place, um, that people are being pushed up against. Their, they're not responding to the to the seed, and the, and and the way that the seed wants to grow, and that and it also talks about the earth. Um, I thought it was very interesting. I I'm, I'm, I I'm apologize, Alan. I was a little sleepy, and but I'm, I might have missed it. You, you might well have already covered this. But it talks about how the Earth, on, uh, it's on my page three, the planet Earth is an entity and the same laws of growth, the same stages of unfoldment apply to it as to the individual. Um, and, then, and then it talks about how if we're not you know, reading these signs, we're not responding to it, then the Earth is, it, it, they're, they're gonna be destructive forces that are, are that take place, right? In which we're seeing. And that sometimes those destructive forces are not necessarily negative, it, that in addition to trying to wake us up, help us wake us up, but it's also the seed trying to grow in the way that it, it wants to grow. And so it's beyond my understanding, obviously, to, to know how is this all gonna shake out and, and like everybody else, um, or many of us, I'm, I'm worried, you know, when I see all the fires and the weather changes and the, the storms and winter and summer and the rising of the ocean and the pollution. And I, you know, it's certainly beyond me to know where it's all going, but to know that some of the destructive forces as with ourselves as individuals are there to, to help the, 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 the divine plan of the seed growth to, to take place is, is reassuring. 
you know, I think that's sort of an imperative in this lecture, you know, that those of us who do have a unit of consciousness are called on to, to spread it or to acknowledge it or to promote it. Yes. And it's nice because I think sometimes I notice that uh, I can feel very isolated from everybody else, right? Uh, you know, when I see the, the decisions of, you know, the court decisions and, and what's happening with violence and people who want to have their guns, it, 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 I feel very separated from them, you know, and I become afraid. But, but when I think about the fact that, <clears throat> okay, we're here together and they're, they're, these are my brothers and sisters, and they, they also have the divine seed within them and the divine consciousness. And that somehow, uh, as Stephen has done, I need to, to meet them where they're at, to respect them, to try to understand and to respond with love. And, and, that, and that that's the best way to, to help them uh, eventually evolve. Because we don't know, you know, at one point, it could be today, right? It could be tomorrow that somebody wakes up, right? You, you had the guy that was testified, some of us may have seen where he was, you, you know, he went down on January 6th and he was part of the whole thing. And then he went over to the to the police officer who who's now disabled, can't be a police officer anymore. And he spoke to him and he asked him for forgiveness. And he, and he said in his testimony, I'm not the same person. I, I'm sorry for what I did. I was wrong. And so he, he woke up. He, he's, he's not going to be the same person anymore. Um, and, and, and so that was, you know, that was, that was encouraging. And, we, and of course, that happens, you know, on a regular basis. We, we may not hear about it or see it. Yeah. Well put. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, anyone else have, have thoughts? I mean, I don't want to digress too much. Uh, puppy is barking here, but that's okay. Puppy boy. <laughs> um, you know, I'm just thinking about the propaganda about crime. Uh -huh. How we have to do something to the immigrants, do something to the people that are committing crimes, put them in jail, do something, something. It's out of control. And I'm thinking that you know, one have to have one have one has to have the courage to not believe that a crime uh, is as threatening as spiritual corruption. And I'm not mm -hmm. making. I don't want to. Um, what I'm trying to say is that you know the Christian message, of course, right? Turn the other cheek, right? In other words, if somebody assaults you, um, it's not a grave spiritual crisis for you. It is for the other person. So, uh, you know, the, the need to protect is in some sense illusory also, I think, especially if we're immortal beings, have yes. immortal souls. So the focus on the need to protect, you know, like the national conversation, you know, yep. we have to protect ourselves from the immigrants. They're coming. <laughs> coming for us. Now, what does that mean spiritually? It's illusory, I would think. Yes. Oh, I think what about the case recently, the bodega worker was um, attacked and he killed the attacker? Do you know that case? Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, do you see, can you give me a spiritual reading on how you see that interaction or, um, uh, you know? Um, well, see, there we are because you, part and parcel what the guide says Mm -hmm. that you're it's not possible to make generalizations when every case is different like you know you can't take a hypothetical because you don't know the facts of it you don't know the state in which everybody was in that situation i mean i would say obviously it's fine it's spiritually right to defend yourself and there was this uh, my mother i think tells the story or this anecdote buddhist anecdote about uh, somebody who kills an intruder into their house and is that spiritually right and the idea is that it may be spiritually right but you still have to deal with the karma of having killed someone um so the issue with the bodega I and mean, i guess i would really have to say that not personally understanding or knowing those entities those individuals i really can't 
decide whether it was justified or not. Um, I'm not sure if that's a good answer, but I mean, certainly I believe that God believes in the right of self-defense. <laughs> you know, uh, I, I think that that's explicit in some lectures. We're not, um, the path work is not, believes in positive aggression, healthy aggression, which I think includes the ability to defend yourself or the, the right to defend yourself. Uh, and then again, in that situation, you know, the wrong was committed by the aggressor. Um, and uh, I'm sure that, that the bodega owner won't be found guilty. So maybe in that sense that, the, you know, our temporal laws mirror spiritual law. Is the that other, can I throw one other thing, Alan, yeah, to, 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 to respond? Uh, the other question is what's going on karmically and spiritually and so the pathwork tells us in other places as well that we have a contract and a contract's very detailed as to what we're going to experience. And, and so is there a, a story behind it karmically and contractually that these individuals agreed to in order to um, elevate themselves spiritually by having had that experience? Right, and, I mean, and, could, and there is no death, right? So we, we, yeah, we sure. I mean, I have could, that ever, yeah. <laughs> everlasting life and, and this is only one life of, you know, infinite number of lives. And so this was the life, the way that this needed to play out for their, everybody's highest right. good yes. in that particular uh, scenario. Obviously, although this would upset a lot of my friends at Transit, obviously the pathwork says that when the decision was made by that guy to accost the bodega owner, what happened was in accord with the higher selves of both parties. Right. And it was an experience that benefited both of them, even though it looked like it's a, si a situation where one was the victim and the other was the victimizer. In true spiritual truth, it, isn't, it was not that way. It was something that was was wished or, or, or somehow created by both of them for a underlying spiritual purpose of teaching each one a lesson enabling them to grow. Yes. Right? I agree with that. Yeah, unit of consciousness. And you know, one has to take that point of view at the same time, not letting the guy that, that attacked the bodega owner off the hook, right? Owner off the hook. Right. We did he use it? We, yeah, still we need to know, did he use excessive force? Right. And we need to, we are, are still called upon to reduce suffering, reduce pain and suffering. And so that was an act that shouldn't, we, we should have tried to prevent if we would have been there, right? Because that is, was the, even though it was right, it's for, from every point of view spiritually, for the paths of those two individuals, it was still a situation where suffering took place and where it could have been about alleviated. And if steps had been taken to alleviate the suffering, it still would have been right for all the parties. Right? I think I'm expressing the pathwork doctrine correctly. What do you think, Tracy? Oh, no. He's here, here she is. I agree with you completely. We're sharing a phone, so he had to pass it to me. Yeah, I... I... I mean, it's, 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 it's tricky because, I mean, clearly we have the right to defend ourselves, but at the same time, we also have an obligation to mitigate harm, both, you know, to ourselves and to others. So, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to pass judgment on any of that kind of stuff, because unless you're there, right, you know, on the moment, yeah. you, just, you just don't know what, what's going down and what the right thing is to do, but. I agree with what you said, though. Right, I think that that is that spiritual truth. That that, of course, is why there are so many movies that show something that looks wrong but is actually right, and the other way right. around, they show something that's right but actually is wrong. That is an outpicturing of that spiritual truth. That's right. I agree. So, any any other thoughts, Susan? You haven't said anything. Uh, Suki, you haven't seen. 
What's well, I think that we're living in, I don't know, for me, probably the most challenging time I've ever lived in. Um, I think that I, I posted something on Facebook, which said something like, even in the face of injustice, injustice, or especially in the face of injustice, especially when you're living in a world which has complete and utter, to me, complete injustice, that it's most important to find the light within that you have and share it with others. So that um, it says you need to labor, the, la the labor, courage, and self honest and honesty of self-knowledge so that you cannot be corrupted by lower self motives. So yeah, it, it almost seems like there's two challenges for me. It's hard for me to separate my own world or living in my own world with living in the world with everyone else. Because in a sense, when I meditate every day, I still am trying to uh, come to resolutions within myself. But I feel when I am more peaceful within that it does transfer out to others. So I think it's kind of a dual challenge that we're um, operating on both levels, uh, working on our better halves and in doing so, helping everyone else and help better the world in spite of the fact of the extreme, I don't wanna say ugliness, but uh, negativity and violence and in spite of it. It's almost like Anne Frank, you know, in spite of everything, people are still good. So it's, I find it more complicated than ever for some reason. And I think that, that maybe we've, we are being challenged I don't want to say purposely, but maybe. Um, yeah, I'd like to say something that uh, relates to that. Um, I keep coming back to on the top of page two. Actually, the destruction is always aimed at eliminating the obstructions, the untruth, the, infring the infringements on div divine unfoldment. Um, and it just feels related to what everybody's been saying, whether it's um, the internal or the global situations that are happening. Um, and I, I feel like I've been living in a much greater sense of peace um, recently um, because I am, um, I guess, I'm connected to the knowing that this is true. Otherwise, it's too unbearable, <laughs> you know, to be in, in the world. But but it makes perfect sense when you think about it. Ellen, what do you think? Hi there, hi everyone. Hi. I um um I unfortunately could I, I was reading you know at the last minute I was reading but I was only getting to skim things so I I think uh I think I have to be mostly listening. I had a bunch of different thoughts but I don't think anything that uh, is going to be too coherent. But um thank you for asking. <laughs> I'm glad yeah, to be sure. here. <laughs> Well, I do feel like this lecture is very timely. I know it was it was delivered in 1975, but 
I, I just feel it's really relevant to right now, personally. Feels like it is. And I keep expecting, like John Lennon would say, peace to break out. And it, it's hard for me to uh, not believe, uh, as, uh, you know, as Mary Ellen says, uh, that there's a lot of like green shoots out there, lots of people working towards spiritual consciousness, striving towards it, kind of it just kind of happening. I think we're gonna wake up, uh, wake up and uh, find that things are very different at some point. Right, right, Happy? <laughs> I, I, I will say that whatever, what I read, seemed like it was describing what's going on today you know so some, some of the stuff i, I read um and you know i, I guess I, i'll say I'll, i'd like to i'll say this i guess you know because in my own life i'm going i like i'm having you know my health issues they're up again and i'm like you know having some intense stuff and i realize but and but now I, I really sense that it is part of a really big shift and that my my body is like Go, you know, going through this crazy, crazy, crazy stuff, and it's really calling me to a deeper consciousness. There was a post on Facebook that was, you know, from like a, you know, one of the spiritual communities on Facebook about, you know, ascension. They talk about ascension and physical symptoms, and I, I don't think I can repeat it too well, but, but that there was something about it that it was just about like these, the manifestation of, you know, illness, and we're having a lot of, you know, illness manifested in our, in our society. Um, and, oh, another thought I was, oh, when Marion was talking and she was talking about, um, she was talking about, you know, the, the personal work, the personal inner work and, you know, facing your own demons. And that a lot of what we're seeing in the world is the struggle, you know, pe people who are res really resisting seeing their own demons are projecting it out into the world. Um, so I think that's, you know, and, and we could have compassion for it by, you know, I mean, it's, you know, it's intense and so challenging, but I think that's one of the ways to see it. Um, yeah. And that's a very valuable insight. Yes. Mm -hmm. I, I want to add, that is a very valuable insight. And I... I appreciate what you said, Stephen, also about following your heart, because we're here to balance our head and our heart with the heart leading the way. And even, and Stephen, I felt you described that exactly how you're following the wisdom of your heart, because even neuropsychologists are saying the heart is the new brain. They're even finding cells in the heart that are similar to brain cells, but they're heart cells. So this shift to following the heart, not about following emotions. It's following that wisdom that you express so well, Stephen. And I and also what's in this lecture is on this page uh, three about the dualistic way of seeing reality is still very deeply embedded in the human consciousness. So everything seems to pose a choice between either the self or the other and the conflicts of conscience that result are often quite severe. And what I've noticed in my life is I've been through tremendous traumas the last year and a half, this hit and run accident that I was in and broken hip and blood clots in my lungs and a stroke and all this trauma. And in coming through it, a level of mask haven't fallen away, more authentic, more real, less mask covering any, everything. But what's happened is those old patterns are in my face for transformation. They, they're more intense and I have to really then connect. I get some help, some outer help, you know, some help with these processes. However, it draws me closer to my God self. It draws me closer to my spirit within because that's the only way, as the guide said, we can dissolve these images and it, the guide uses the metaphor with the hand of God. It's a metaphor. And everybody's different how we do this. But I'm finding that very intensely now that everything that I've worked on for decades in the path work, all the early childhood images and beliefs and how I had to work so hard and nobody looked at me and nobody said hardly ever that they loved me. All of a sudden, when I'm releasing my lower self the other day, what comes up is that. And I have in my to-do list, complaint sessions throughout the day but i'm complaining to god because god wants everything uh, everything everything 
my God self wants. And so I have my complaint sessions throughout the day. And lo and behold, what came up was a more release level of issues I worked on, images from my childhood that I worked on decades and decades ago. And But I got that little ping in the brain about, oh, I'm getting closer to release them. And there is what we've learned in the path that we retain some early childhood experiences our whole life to use as a gateway for transformation, not flopping back into them and rolling around in the mud, but as a gateway. So here what came up when I was in my complaint session with God was these early childhood stuff, images. And I thought, oh my gosh. And they were a whole different perspective, but they were there. So I, I felt very blessed. I felt very blessed. I thought, oh my gosh, they're lighter. They're ready more to float away. And what did it come through? The gateway of my complaining. Because <laughs> my, my God self loves it when I complain because I'm bringing out some assertive energy. Yeah. I'm not swallowing it and I'm not acting it out. Yeah. I just love Marion. I just, well, I don't know why, but I just loved hearing it. I just made me teary. And this is like so heart opening and wonderful to hear your process. It's really, it's great. <laughs> Lots of love to you. <laughs> You're the person who got me here, in case people don't know that. <laughs> well, we did, we did it together. Yeah. You know, what I find amazing is that I read a lot and, and I watch a lot of PBS. And recently I saw the um, the telescope that they launched. I think it's called the Web or Web Telescope or whatever. Brilliant. I mean, absolutely brilliant. Um, it's out there millions of miles away and they had to open it up and all that. And the photos they're taking, just incredible. And you realize and they showed you the launch and, and, and all that. And you realize such brilliant people working on this and, and the amount of money and intelligence that went into it and energy and dedication. And then I, I, I read the Wall Street Journal and they have pictures of the war in the Ukraine and the weapons that the Ukrainians are getting. And you know, I, I hate to say this, but it's equally brilliant. It's just weapons of destruction to kill. But the intelligence behind the weapon, the guided missiles, the rapid fire is brilliant. And yet you look, there's a common area of brilliance on both sides. And how do you reconcile that? If we're able to reconcile all that intelligence, and, and it is brilliant, and all that energy, and all that money, I think we can have a real paradise. And maybe that's where we're going, and I'd like to think so. But I, I think the intelligence is, is there for it to happen on both sides and, and, and to come together. Um, it's just, my bother and I, I'm, I'm just amazed that we could have both sides of the equation equally brilliant working on black and white whatever you want to call it so you know I, I don't know where I'm going with this other than I think there are so many resources on this planet in terms of intelligence in terms of money if we can just pull it all together in one direction, it would be incredible. And I'm not sure how to do that, but anyway. What Steve you're saying is really sparking me because you're pointing to something which to me is really powerful, which is that you're talking about the intelligence behind destructive forces. Well, that's nature. <laughs> that is totally nature. I mean, supernovas and the big bang and suns and stars. That to me is the key to understanding what we see, you know, is that is that nature, I mean, every spiritual tradition has the, you know, the deities of destruction because creativity can't happen without destruction. 
And that's what I was talking about with my physical, you know, that that's what it's saying. It's like, unless we experience what Marion's talking about, unless we can experience the destruct, you know, this personal destructive forces. Oh. I know I'm very, like, I just like really sparked by everything you just said, Steve. It's like really help, helps me. Well, I mean, I just want to make the observation, of course, that the guy talks about all the exactly the same thing. I mean, it's one energy card, whether it's put into a, a direction of destructiveness or creativity, the energy is the same. And it's just a question of transforming the way it's directed, clearing the distortion so that the energy could come into the positive direction instead of the negative direction. But the, the great power and energy, I think that's a very um, good insight, obviously, Stephen, that you had about the tremendous brilliance and intelligence that it takes to fight a war, <laughs> right? I mean, it does. The drones, you know, all the air aircraft and the planning and all that other stuff, those are positive qualities in and of themselves. They're put to destructive ends, but the energy can be liberated in a more positive direction. And let's hope we all are going in that direction. Absolutely. Well, you know, yeah. interesting. Uh, Alan, just quickly, you know, when it talks about how sometimes the destructive forces uh, within ourselves or, or in the world are part of this unfoldment that is, is leading to a, a better place, that, I mean, at least from my point of view, standing up to tyranny um, is, is, is a requirement. And so sometimes that entails violence and involves killing. Um, and so, uh, you know, hopefully that's, you know, the, 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 <laughs> that's part of what's taking place. And, 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 and so destruction of, of, of uh, negativity has to take place, right? Just like we destroy it within ourselves, it, it, it has to be destroyed in the world. We, we, we have to make choices, right? There right. are pe people who want to control us and, and use us and kill us and whatever. And, and, and we have to stand up to that. We have to know what we stand up for, right? Um, and so even though it's a destruction, it's hopefully it's in the highest good. Yeah, the guy actually know? explicitly says that in the lecture, right? Um, if you happen to live in a land whose government is corrupt and requires the individual to commit acts against humanity, that is against God, to follow the outer law would be going against divine law. It requires a great deal of courage to stand up for the inner truth and defy the outer law. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I think that this wonderful subject of the transformation of negativity into positivity you know, the, the grappling of the warring parts within ourselves, the, the um, apprehension of the unity of consciousness. It's very exciting. And like, um, I'm like Stephen, I choose to see it happening all over the place. I, I just feel it. And uh, God, you know, more power to it. And to all of us as people that are willing to stand up for, for those, uh, you know, for those realities and for that consciousness. Yeah, and I, I just one quick comment on that, Alan. You know, when I think back to when I first started uh, meditating, and then and then I had a chance to try to share it and teach other people. Um, I I went to the local high school, and I, I couldn't even call it meditation because it was too far out there. You know, I'm talking like '94, and I had to call it stress reduction or breathing, right? And even today, in in a lot of settings. Uh, people are not comfortable with uh, this meditation. You, you, it's focused on breath work or mindfulness. Uh, and, and of course, mindfulness <clears throat> is just another form of, of meditation. Uh, but, but when you, you look kind of globally at the United States, uh, you know, the health food movement, uh, what, where, how the awareness has grown since the 50s and 60s, and how it's even McDonald's, right, is, is offering uh, 
happy meals that are that are that are trying to be healthy you know in comparison to to what was there before and and you think about all the all the health spas for people to go and to meditate or you know to eat good food and to try to um uh, uh to get in touch with themselves in an inner way, all the spiritual centers of all different kinds of denomination, the Eastern traditions, all the presence of Buddhism in so many different centers and different forms across the United States. Um, so, so, but, but the news doesn't promote this, right? I mean, if I'm even if I'm watching PBS, it's not giving me this view of how much individuals are transforming themselves how much time people are now spending on inner work and and health i mean just look at health the health boom right of how many uh, trace and i used to go to the gym Did, we we never had a problem getting a spot in the pool now you, you know, we have to sign up to get a spot in the pool mm -hmm. why because people are more health conscious and 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 so that's a wonderful thing so mm -hmm. i think there's a lot of transformation that's taking place that we don't we don't see we're not so aware of it because the negative forces don't want us to see that they want us to be afraid right and the media sells fear let's face it it sells fear it's not set it's not there to make us feel good about ourselves it's a good point really that you're saying what you're saying because sometimes when opposition comes up you know by the powers to be and want to keep humanity you know, press down uh, is seen as very, very, very negative. But as all spiritual masters say, opposition serves. In the world of duality, opposition serves. It serves to strengthen the, the expansion into the expanded state. And therefore, if you turn and fight with the opposition, you match the energy. So it's healthy boundaries, boundaries, like some people have to be put in jail, some people you have to say no to, some people you don't vote for them or whatever it is these boundaries, but opposition serves. And I think that's so important to remember rather than, oh, we've got opposition and that's really horrible. No, the opposition serves to strengthen the might of the right. And it will, the others will just kind of fade away at some point, maybe generations from now, I don't know, but it will eventually fade away with that kind of healthy boundaries and spreading our arms into the open, new life yeah that's a good note um marion <laughs> that's a, a beautiful, beautiful way to put it um so any other thoughts shall we do our meditation what do you think oh yes oh yes well i think we have a lot to meditate on tonight our discussion um i'll just read does anyone want to say something are we okay? All right. I will read another par a brief part of the paragraph that I read before on page seven. And does anyone have a candle? We're going for one, Alan. Good. Okay. I, I know you'll find one there somewhere. Oh, thank you, Tracy. I'll read a short excerpt from the lecture and then we'll have a, what do you think, 10 minute meditation. A lot of food for thought. Oh, thank you. Okay. Once you want to awaken, you must be overwhelmed by the grandeur of this divine scheme in which all is well, 
and there is nothing to fear if you choose to see this plan and go with it. You know your inner truth. No one else can tell it to you. No one act is right or wrong per se on that level. Yet it is also true at certain times that your inner plan, your divine self wishes you, needs you to go into a certain direction and not in another. But this cannot be superimposed from the outside. Only when you go very deeply into yourself and transcend the rules, the adherence to public opinion, give up the facade and the self-interest that comes from the lower self, the need to please as well as the need to rebel and to spite, will you find the ultimate truth. All outer help can show you only how to go deeply enough to recognize your investment in a false vision of reality. Those outside of you can often see the maze you cannot see and can therefore help you. But the ultimate realization is that of your own inner law once you find your inner God. All right, my friends, let's meditate for 10 minutes. <clears throat> 